Uh, welcome everyone to tonight's presentation from the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. My name is Marisa Gomez. I am the museum's public programs manager, and it's just my distinct honor and pleasure to have the job of connecting my community with our environment through programs like tonight's talk from Charles Hood, Jose Gabriel Martinez Fonseca, and Aaron Westing. And before I uh, formally welcome all of them in, I did want to just briefly go over a few things. First, I want to acknowledge that the museum resides on the traditional and unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Awaswaz Nation. And today these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsin Tribal Band, whose ancestors were taken to Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast. And the Amamutsin are working hard to fulfill their obligation to creator, to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts in the Amamutsin Land Trust. Also want to note that we're gonna be communicating together using the chat. So your um, video and mic are disabled, but we still wanna chat with you. Um, so to do that, if you could take a moment and change the default setting from host and panelists to the option for everyone. And then that way, um, I think it's still defaulting to that. Who knows, Zoom changes all the time. But um, uh, we wanna make sure that everyone can see what it is that you are sharing. And if you wanna say hello by sharing where you're streaming in from, and then what's your favorite herp? It looks like we got a couple of favorite herps listed. We've got uh, from San Diego, favorite is horned lizards. And also another horned lizard fan, lots of horned lizard fans, who would have known? Um, so if you are now inspired to drop in your favorite frog or lizard or snake or salamander, do so. Oh, Dylan, hello. Um, Dylan, I'm sure, yes, I can tell that this would be a, a difficult one for you to choose, but I can't wait to hear um, which one you land on. And now I'm gonna formally bring in our guests for tonight. So you're starting to see them here on screen. Um, we are joined tonight by Charles Hood, who is, there you are, who is a Fulbright Scholar, a former National Science Foundation artist in residence in Antarctica. Um, any herps in Antarctica? Is that the only place where there's no herps? You're, you're muted, but. Just on, just on the coffee mugs. Oh, <laughs> great. Um, and then also you're the author of Wild LA, A California's Guide to the Birds Among Us, and the new book, Sea Turtles to Sidewinders, um, which is this, which we do have in our museum store. So I'll send a link to this afterwards. This is what we're talking about today, um, written with our other guests. So we have Jose Gabriel Martinez Fonseca, who is a Nicaraguan biologist and wildlife photographer who has worked with amphibians and reptiles for over 12 years and is currently a PhD student at Northern Arizona University. And Aaron Westing, who has done extensive field work across Western North America and the Neotropics and is currently a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley where she studies spiny lizards, um, similar to horned lizards, same as horned lizards. Same family, same we'll talk family. about both. Okay, cool, we got a lot of fans here. So that's great to hear. Um, keep on sharing your favorite uh, herps in the chat and maybe you will have a new one after tonight's talk. And on that note, I'm gonna hand it over to y'all to, to share what you got for us. Awesome, thank you, Marisa. Thank you, it's lovely to be with everybody. Uh, some of you I may know from the Catamaran Literary Festivals, plural, and the journal itself and uh, readings in the tannery. I hope we're overlapping a little bit, but it's lovely to be with you and to be talking about an un popular with the public anyway, and a little bit underappreciated, a little bit feared group of animals that we think are utterly spectacular and really worth loving on and appreciating and celebrating. And especially for me, I'm happy to be with my two co-panelists who are both PhD candidates, both very brilliant young people and watch for their names because you're gonna see them in the both scientific literature and popular literature in years to come. Thank you, Charles. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining us and I hope you'll enjoy our little tour, which we're calling a tour of the most fascinating reptiles and amphibians of the American West. It sounds like we have some herpers in the audience, so you'll have to let us know if you agree with uh, the herps that we've chosen to highlight. But is everyone seeing my screen right now? Great. That looks good. Awesome. 
So we'll start out by talking about what is herpetology? Um, why do we study reptiles and amphibians together as a group? Uh, a lot of other groups have their own ology. I heard that you got a talk on oology last week, so that's pretty neat. Um, after that, we'll take a tour through the major herp groups and we'll focus on the herps that we can find in our area of the Western United States. Um, and for each of those major groups, we'll feature a particular animal. All of them are California endemic, so hopefully something that you're either familiar with or if you weren't already familiar with it, will pique your interest and maybe you'll go out and try and find it. Then we'll talk about why the US West is such a great place for herping. And we'll conclude with a little bit of the context of our book, um, some of the goals that we had while we were writing the book and what we hope that you'll get out of it. And then of course, at the end, we'll have time for question and answer, anything that you might have thought of um, and audience participation. So herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. These are two groups of animals that are actually separated by a lot of evolutionary time. They're not each other's closest relatives. Um, and actually all birds that we see today are part of the larger group of reptiles. Uh, but we study them together because they have a lot of commonalities in their ecology. We find a lot of them at night. We find a lot of them in moist places. Uh, we'll talk a little bit at the end about how to go out and look for herps, but there are a lot of reasons why it makes sense to really work on reptiles and amphibians together as a unit. So reptiles are the large group that includes turtles, lizards, snakes, crocodilians, and this group called worm lizards that are really cool. Uh, the last two aren't found in our area, so we won't focus on them, but they're really neat animals. Some things that all reptiles share is that they breathe air, they lay eggs, they have scales, and they're cold-blooded, which just means that they have to get heat from their environment. They don't generate their own heat. And they can be active at any time of the day or night. Amphibian loosely translates to both lives, which alludes to the fact that these animals spend part of their life on wa in water and part of it on land. These are the frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians. Uh, they breathe through their skin. They also, many of them have lungs, but some of them have completely lost their lungs and they breathe entirely through their skin. And because of that, they need moisture to survive. They have to keep that skin moist so that they can translate that oxygen uh, into usable forms for them. And so because of that, most of them are nocturnal. If they spent all day in the sun, their skin would dry out or desiccate. And so the best time to find amphibians is at night. So herpetologists really loosely just study reptiles and amphibians in the wild or in the lab. Uh, and they're interested in their behaviors, their diets, their traits. You know, why is this salamander red and this one is brown? What types of temperatures do they need to survive? How do they interact with other species, including humans? A lot of conservation herpetologists study how human behavior and human activities are affecting herps in our areas. Uh, their evolutionary histories, which is what I'm really interested in. How did we get so many herps? Why do they look the way that they do? And so much more. If there's something about a reptile or amphibian that's really interesting to you, I can almost guarantee that there is a scientist who has spent a very long time thinking about that same question. So starting out with our uh, first group of reptiles, this is the turtles. There's about 350 species worldwide. And one really cool thing about turtles that I didn't know until I started studying biology is that the shell that you see around them is actually derived from their ribs. So they don't have separate ribs and other uh, bones inside of their shell, that is their ribs. And some scientists who've used uh, the fossil record and some reconstructions have shown that progression of the ribs getting wider and flatter and fusing together to form that heavy shell that they use to protect themselves from predators. Because they don't have ribs like we have, when you take a deep breath in, you can feel your rib cage expand and contract. They have to use different mechanisms to breathe air. Um, and so you can often see turtles moving their necks around. They're doing that so that they can expand and contract those muscles and get air into their chest. They can also even breathe through their cloaca. The cloaca is the organ that all herps use to reproduce and to excrete waste. So they have one organ for both of those functions. Um, and some turtles, when they're hibernating, they put their heads underwater and they actually leave their cloaca out of the water to breathe. Turtles have really cool breeding behavior. Many of them uh, nest in the same area, in fact, on the same exact beaches where they were born. And they have this really cool innate homing behavior. They don't actually have to learn where to swim to lay their eggs, even if it's hundreds of miles. It's just sort of pre-programmed into their brain like having a you know, MapQuest or Garmin, letting you know exactly where to go when it's time to lay your eggs. 
So this is a really interesting behavior that has fascinated scientists for a long time, but it also poses some risks for the turtles uh, because when they do put all of their eggs in one basket, so to speak, uh, that raises the possibility that a, a predator or poachers could come through and collect a lot of eggs at once. There's this other cool thing that happens with turtle eggs while they're incubating. Um, so sex determination is what makes us males or females. Um, in humans, we have biological sex and gender concepts, which are different, um, but in turtles, they are partially, you know, whether an egg develops into a male or female turtle is partially determined by genetics, but it also can be affected by the temperature that the egg is incubated at. And so usually as temperatures increase, you get a higher ratio of females to males. Um, and that can be a really interesting thing to think about in relation to climate change, because as overall ambient air temperatures increase, we might see skewed sex ratios in lots and lots of clutches, especially given that a lot of these eggs are incubating in the same exact area, and that can pose future problems for the next generation of mating. If we have far more females than males, that can reduce effective population sizes. Um, a little feature on tortoises. We often get question, the question, what's the difference between turtles and tortoises? Tortoises are turtles. They're just special land turtles, um, and the main difference is the habitat. So they're found in dry desert areas. Um, this desert tortoise from the Mojave National Preserve uh, is a really good example of the desert habitat that tortoises like to live in. Um, they have a noticeable difference, which is this really rounded shell compared to the sort of flattened shell of turtles. Uh, aquatic turtles are really designed to swim fast through the water, whereas tortoises that lumber around on land, they're designed more for burrowing rather than swimming, so they have that big dome shell. So our feature turtle is the green sea turtle. They can get between three and four feet and 100 and 400 pounds. So these are really large animals. They're mostly herbivorous, they eat plants um, and they have that classic flattened body for aquatic turtles. They have really big front flippers that help them push water and move quickly through the water. They have this beak like mouth, almost like a parrot. Um, and like sea turtles that we talked about before, they lay their eggs on tropical beaches. Um, and they've got this really cool adaptation that allows them to drink seawater. Uh, seawater is too salty for most of us. If you ever get a mouthful, it's really unpleasant. Um, but they have this special organ uh, right by the eye that can allow them to extrude that extra salt and turn the salt water into fresh water that their body can process. A lot of birds have this adaptation too, seabirds. Um, and Jose and Charles took these, uh, the picture on the top here. Um, and I believe this was from the San Gabriel River. Is that right? Yes. So okay. the boundary between Long Beach and Orange County, Seal Beach, uh, is okay. a river. And that river, the San Gabriel River, has power plants and their outflow is warm. And so I was telling the uh, my co-panelists that every time I go there, I have seen sea turtles. So this is urban Los Angeles, uh, right off the 405 freeway. Uh, but there are sea turtles permanently out in Anaheim Bay. Uh, but then they come upstream uh, into the brackish water. And with a little bit of patience, you can see up to six or seven at once. Super cool. Thanks, Charles. So yeah, good place to go see them if you haven't already. So now we'll move on to the next group of reptiles, the lizards. Um, and we don't pick favorites, but if I had to, I think lizards would be my favorite herp. There's 3,000 species worldwide, and they vary tremendously in size from these tiny geckos that you can fit on your thumbnail, all the way up to Komodo dragons, which we know can um, take down water buffaloes as prey. Some cool things about lizards are that they shed their skin and they can lose their tails. You might be familiar with this tail loss adaptation, um, but it's a really cool thing that lizards have evolved to do because it can enable them to, if they're being chased by a predator, they can voluntarily uh, pop off the end portion of their tail. Um, they have these processes in the bones that just enable for a nice clean cut. Um, and they can, you know, pop off their tail and the tail will continue to wiggle. There's still, you know, active processes that are allowing it to move. And so if you're a predator chasing a lizard and this little bit has just flown off and is now flapping around in front of you, that might be enough to distract you so that the lizard can actually make a clean escape. You're distracted by the tail, but the lizard's going to be fine because most lizards can actually regenerate that tail tip. Lizards have a lot of other really cool anti-predator defenses. Um, so a lot of you said that you liked horned lizards. Uh, I also really liked horned lizards. They've got 
fascinating anti-predator defenses. One that many people are familiar with is that they can shoot blood from their eyes. It's not actually from their eyeball. It's a little sinus or vein behind the eye um, that's sort of been co-opted to be really flexible and allow them to shoot that blood um, to distract predators or just kind of freak them out. Uh, they also rely a lot on crypsis, like this guy on the top. He's just trying to blend in with the rocks there. Uh, they might try sprinting away. Um, other lizards are a lot faster than these horned lizards. Um, so there are some sand lizards, especially if you ever go out into the desert that are really, really fast. And that's just their main anti-predator defense. Some lizards are venomous, uh, like Gila monsters or Mexican beaded lizards. Um, but this horned lizard, I just want to spend another second on because What's really interesting about them is that they sort of switch between these anti-predator defenses based on who they're actually faced with. So some research has shown that if you present a horned lizard with different types of predators, they'll choose their anti-predator response accordingly. So with more fast moving predators that they probably can't outrun, they'll just hunker down and really try and rely on that crypsis. Um, so, you know, something really fast comes up and they'll just, they'll just stay and hide. Whereas if there's something that they probably could outrun, they might try that blood spurting mechanism just to sort of distract them initially, and then they'll sprint in the other direction. So really cool confluence of, you know, these evolutionary adaptations, behavior, and uh, predator communities. So our feature lizards are spiny lizards. I'm studying them for my dissertation, so I'm really partial to this group of lizards. There's over a hundred species and they range from Canada all the way down to Panama and Central America. They're pretty easily observable. Um, they're usually pretty charismatic. They like to be noticed um, and they often occur in really high abundance. So this is a really good lizard if you're just sort of getting into herping to go and try and find as many spiny lizards as you can. I bet in Santa Cruz, you probably see a lot of blue bellies or fence lizards. Um, they do occur across lots of habitats. So there are desert spiny lizards that you can find in the desert. Um, there are some, the granite spiny lizard in extreme Southern California, this guy over here, likes those big rocky outcroppings. Um, and what I'm really interested in is this trade-off that they have between being cryptic, uh, being as blended in with their background as possible. So this granite spiny lizard that has this sort of like, you know, gray iridescence to try and blend in with that granite uh, versus this other extreme selection pressure that they face, which is to attract and find a mate. And they do that by using these really bright blue patches underneath. Um, and they use those to, sh to signal to other individuals in their area, you know, both males will signal to females like, hey, aren't my blue patches really bright and attractive? Um, I'm eating really well. Don't you want to mate with me? They'll also use them to try and ward off other males in their territory and tell them like, hey, you know, I've been eating really well. I'm really strong. Don't try and invade my territory. So I'm really interested in this trade-off that they experience between trying to be as uh, discreet and cryptic as possible on the top while also being as showy um, and bright as possible on the bottom. So moving on to snakes. Snakes, which really are just lizards, they're, they're nested within that same big family group um, that lizards belong to, but they're a special type of lizard because they lack legs. Um, there are some other distinctions that separate snakes from other legless lizards. We know that lizards can lose their forelimbs, their hind limbs, or both, um, but snakes are, are a different type of a completely legless lizard. There's 3,500 species in the world and more are being described all the time. They have these really elongated bodies. They have the reduction of one of their lungs. So they really only have one super long functional lung. They have this really mobile skull. Um, so our, our teeth sit on two bones, one for our upper jaw and one for our lower jaw, but snakes actually have eight tooth bearing bones and they're all connected by soft tissue and ligaments. Um, and that enables them to expand those bones around really large prey um, and sort of walk their jaws along it to eat. So snakes don't actually have to eat every day. They can eat one big meal and then rest for a long time. They also don't have eyelids um, and they have no external ears. They have a forked tongue. Uh, this is a really well-known and common trait that people like to draw upon in folklore, this forked tongue of snakes. And they use that to sample chemicals in the air. And they have a special organ called the Jacobson's organ that sits on the top of their upper palate. And they sample chemicals from the environment and put them on that Jacobson's organ to understand what's going on around them. 
So venomous snakes often catch the attention of a lot of people. Um, people might be afraid of them or might be mystified by them. In reality, venomous snakes are actually fewer than 20% of all extant snake diversity. Um, so less than 20% of all snake species are venomous. There are a lot of myths about rattlesnakes and coral snakes, which are two venomous representatives in the US West as well. Um, so you might have heard that rhyme, red touch yellow, kill a fellow, red touch black, friend of Jack. So that works okay if you're only herping in uh, Arizona, but if you go into Central America, there are lots of coral snakes uh, that have really different color patterns. Some of them can be all black, some of them can be just red and black, uh, black and white or yellow banded. So our, our personal philosophy is never pick up something that you can't positively 100% identify because you never know. There are also a lot of other snakes that are not necessarily venomous that have capitalized on this color pattern. A lot of predators have learned to avoid that red banding on snakes because they know just how venomous coral snakes are. So you might see a lot of king snakes or other types of snakes that have some type of red banding um, and they are hoping that the predators will look at them and think, ah, it's probably not worth it. I won't, I won't try and touch that king snake. Rattlesnakes as well, there's a lot of myths about rattlesnakes being overly aggressive or chasing people. Um, and there's really actually few records that type of behavior rattlesnake. Uh, more so, they'll just try and let you know where they are. They'll give you a rattle or maybe a hiss. Um, and, you know, we just always say be, ca be cautious and respectful and give space when you can. Um, don't try and grab a rattlesnake because, um, you know, they do also have that venom that can lead to really painful bites. So our feature snake is the sidewinder rattlesnake. Uh, they have those really cool uh, horns. Those are modified scales above the eyes. Uh, they're found in the Mojave and the Sonoran deserts in sandy and rocky areas. And they're generally pretty nocturnal. They spend their days undercover, but in some of the colder months, you can actually find them during the day. Um, they make these characteristic S-shaped or J-shaped tracks throughout the sand, which maybe you've seen. And this is a good way for them to keep cool by keeping uh, a lot of their body elevated. And it's an efficient way to move through the sand. Um, and you can sometimes find them climbing vegetation to eat. They like to eat uh, little birds or bird eggs, which might be nesting in bushes. And so you can often find them climbing up to try and get a snack. So now Jose is gonna tell you some more about amphibians. Oh, thank you. Um, so yes, so there are two big groups of amphibians that we have in, in the Western US. Um, the other one will be uh, Sicilians, which uh, don't occur in the Eastern US, but in other parts of the world, but um, we're not gonna cover, him, uh, cover them here. Um, uh, salamanders is a pretty big, diverse group. Um, there's about 600 species worldwide. And in fact, the US is one of the hotspots for diversity um, in the world. Um, in the Appalachian Mountains in the east and the coastal and Sierras of California and Oregon are um, some of the, the top diversity places. So we're very lucky to, to have them uh, that accessible. Most salamanders are very secretive and nocturnal but some species could also uh, have some activity in the day. Um, they have all these, uh, most of them, unless has these elongated bodies that cannot resemble a lizard. But we need to remember that these are two groups that separated over 350 million years ago. So they have been in their own evolution, evolution, uh, <laughs> evolution path uh, for quite a while now. Um, yeah, next. So our uh, feature uh, salamander is a California newt. And as many of you know, this one possesses a really potent toxin uh, to, the, uh, to avoid being uh, predated. And they, they have really interesting uh, in, interspecies um, relationships. And one of those is with the garter snakes, the common garter snakes that overlap in range with, with uh, these newts have these arms raised in which um, the newts evolve um, or are selected for more toxic skin. And then the garter snakes uh, evolve some resistance. So they 
leap for each other. And this is a very local effect. So only where the species of Garda snakes overlap with the, with the newt, um, it, is, it has been shown that um, snakes from other ranges where California newts don't occur, don't have the same uh, resistance to, 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 to the poison of, of, the, of the newts. Um, and because of this arm rays and these bright colors, there's also this effect of mimicry, just like with um, coral snakes and king snakes, where our species copy the, the coloration of the, of, of the newts and try to um, use that to avoid uh, being predated. And here in the, in the lower right, you, you will see a very similar uh, salamander. And this one is actually an insatina. And the Ensatina copy this coloration in the more or less the same range where the newts occur, but um, Ensatinas have a really great variation of different coloration um, that extends way further from the California newts. Some, some have blotches and, and can be very dark, but um, yeah, they pretend to be newts in, in, in the range where predators know that newts are, uh, are uh, Poisonous. Next one. So the other huge group is the, is, uh, uh, the frogs. There's about 6,000 species worldwide, and they're more or less all um, in a similar, have a similar shape with these um, really strong back legs that allow them to, to jump and give this characteristic saltatorial locomotion. And one thing that we always joke is, uh, but this also has kind of true, is that they're basically stomachs uh, with legs. If they they have these really wide mouths, and um, they they basically feed on anything they can they can feed. And and this uh, and some species, especially the big ones, this could be other frogs. They can feed on birds. Um, that in our book we highlight a, a record of. Uh, a bullfrog eating a bat, but um, there, there's also records of them eating small possums and um, mice and yeah, all, all, all kinds of things. Um, so uh, many, many of these um, uh, tadpoles are one of the things that we know from frogs that are very commonly seen. And a lot of the adaptations of frogs also had to do with this uh, kind of reproduction and metamorphosis. And frog eggs are really, really um, um, high value in, in nutrition for many prayers. So um, a lot of the behavior of frogs is about like trying to keep those, those eggs uh, safe. And many frogs um, can, can have a very uh, complex parental care. Um, in the case of um, da poison dart frogs in Central America and South America, uh, some of the frogs can carry the, the tadpoles in their backs one by one and move them from a little pond to another one or from some plant that's collecting water to, to another as their resources become more, uh, you know, uh, lacking in one place or the other. Um, some other frogs are, have a, a, a system where they, they, they basically hatch the, the, the eggs in their mouth. So if a predator comes, they can escape with them. Or, um, or also they can really like pick where to lay these eggs uh, as far or as easy to escape from predators as possible. So some, some frogs lay their eggs um, under a leaf on top of a little pond and they're taken care or guarded by one of the parents. And if a predator comes and tries to eat those eggs and predators of eggs could be like a snake. There are many snakes that specialize in frog's eggs. The, the frog can uh, dump the eggs in the water and kind of like um, help those eggs survive. survive. Um, in other cases, the eggs are just on top of the water and as the little tadpole evolve, uh, develops inside the egg, they basically, they, they finally hatch and they just 
uh, drop in the water. And this is a very like, uh, it's, it's a very complex behavior for, for an animal that, that, that we think is, is relatively simple, but it has to do with like visualizing what, what could happen in the future and being very, very aware of the environment that you choose to, to lay the eggs. So yeah, for frogs, um, springtime, this time of the year is one of the best ones. Um, things are warming up and there's a bit more rain. Um, so this is kind of like the, the prime time to, to go look for them. And many of the, the frogs can be found because of their calls for, for mating. And this is something that also works against them because there are predators that will capitalize on, on, on being on, on, on how loud they, they are now and being kind of like exposed. And here in the upper right, you will see there's a bat. This is a, a frog eating bat. And as the name indicates, uh, they really specialize in, in, in uh, hunting frogs. And this, this bat that live in Central America and South America, um, where you can have a site with 50 different species of frogs, they, they, they know how to identify the, the species of frog that's making a call and, and they, they can know if it's safe to eat or not. Remember, we have some poison bar frogs and, and very toxic <laughs> species. So they, they know what to avoid and what is, is safe to, to snack on. So our feature frog is the black toad. And this is a species that I personally like a lot because of the, the history they have. Um, this is an endemic for, uh, toad of California is is found in a in seven to nine little springs in the Inyo County, and in the photo here in the upper upper right, you can you can actually see basically the totality of the species distribution. Um, this um, its name in Latin means exile toad, and it's because this toad actually was part of a was closely related to the boreal and the California toad, but 12,000 years ago, with changes in the climate and um, vegetation, they basically ended isolated or exiled into these little uh, springs around uh, this lake. So um, they, they are one of the species of, of uh, with the least area in the US and also of all the toads is one of the most aquatic ones. Um, so yeah, I thought that was pretty cool and worth to, no, uh, to note and not many people know about this species. But. So why is the Western US a great place for herping? Um, it, it is a great place because um, we have so many different habitats we have from desert close to sea level in Southern Arizona to high desert to areas with a lot more precipitation in, 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 the, nor in the Northwest. And also we, ha we have all these barriers that have, uh, favor have favored uh, speciation. So we have all these deserts in between, these mountain ranges, big rivers, and, and also, um, which is really great is that a lot of this land has been saved for uh, national parks or national forests, which means uh, we, are, we still have the, the amount of uh, habitat that in many other places of the world is, is already gone. So um, it, it is really convenient that we, we have that much wilderness relatively close and, and with that diversity of ecosystems and species. So how do you find um, reptiles and amphibians? Um, as Erin mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, these two groups are often grouped together because they are relatively similar in where they are found and what times are best. So a lot of the animals you can find are um, during the daytime will be hiding in places to stay cool 
And that's what we as helpers call flipping and basically looking for good cover for fields of reptiles and, and turning them over and, and see, uh, just like in the photo here where uh, move, uh, many lines skink. Um, if you do this, always be, be careful and how you do it and also careful for the animal. Don't, don't smash it when you put it back. And also keep in mind that um, they are very dependent to these microhabitats. So if you disturb this and you don't uh, repl uh, replace it in, in a good way, um, that that microhabitat might not be longer suitable for, for the animal that was there. And a lot of these animals have very few mobility. So um, it, it might be really hard for them to find another, another place to, to hide during the day. But uh, for some of the more skittish or larger species, uh, binoculars are really great. If you are out birding, don't, don't forget to check fence lines and rocks and look for the silhouette of um, lizards and sometimes even snakes, you can spot them from far away. Um, the other thing is bring a bright flashlight or, or mirror even the, the day. So uh, you can check cra crevices and um, the, the mirror is a good trick where you direct the sunlight to, to just look into the crevices. Um, and for amphibians, of course, any source of water. Also, um, yeah, water, water for amphibians, but also you can find maybe a snake looking for, um, for prey in, in, in the same places. And especially in the desert after one night of rain or a couple of nights after, um, it's incredible how much uh, animals come out from, from literally the underground. Um, and in places like um, the, nor the Northwest, that has a lot more air moisture and um, the, the forest is wetter in general. Um, even during the day, you can, you can find some uh, amphibians like moving around. Um, at nighttime, one of the most fun things we, we do uh, looking for amphibians is the rock cruising, just be safe. Um, it's basically just, driving really slow on, on lonely roads and uh, looking for animals that are just trying to commute maybe from where like a hibernacula to a reproduction site or maybe to a feeding area, like one of the ponds. Um, so always bring your headlamps, don't forget to put the parking lights and um, yeah, just, just be safe, pull over. <laughs> Um, you, you want to talk about this, Erin? Or... Sure. So while we're talking about all the cool herps that we can see in our area and some strategies for going out and finding them, um, we always love to encourage people to record what you see, either bringing a little field notebook, one of those little write in the rain. Uh, those are great because if it gets wet, you can still write with a pencil. Um, or increasingly now we can use our smartphones to get really good data that scientists can use uh, to understand how species ranges are changing through time, uh, how species traits are changing. Um, so a couple of those are iNaturalist. Um, that's a pretty common one. It has a really easy to use phone app that you can use to take a photo of something. And if you have cell service where you're herping, you can upload it right away and it'll use those coordinates to um, let other herpers know what you found. Or you can always upload them later, maybe after a trip, you can put all your pictures together. Um, there's a couple of cool things that iNaturalist does. One is that it'll give you a map if you put in, like if you're really interested in horned lizards, you can type it in and see a map of good places in your area to go looking for them. It also can buffer the points for sensitive species, species that um, might be on the decline or are endangered. If you think like, hey, I found this really cool, uh, you know, special black toad, but maybe I don't want everyone knowing where they can find them, um, it'll put a little buffer zone around that locality. So um, the right people can find out where to find them, but not just anyone. There's another app by the iNaturalist family called Seek, which is really good. Um, it uses machine learning and AI to identify plants and animals for you. So if you are not wanting to carry out a bunch of field guides and sift through things, you can just take a picture with your phone and see some suggestions based on your area and what other people have been observing of what 
they think that plant or animal is. Um, and there's one specific for herps called herp mapper. That's another cool one to check out. So what we hope to accomplish with our book was to be able to provide you with the best, uh, most up-to-date scientific information that you need to really appreciate the amazing diversity of herps, um, but without all the unnecessary jargon. So at least for me, when I was getting into herping, um, you know, you get all your field guides. But sometimes you don't totally know what all of these different things mean. What's a dorsolateral stripe? You know, what's there's all these specific terms, um, and of course, those are really important, and you'll get to know them. But you don't necessarily need them to just go out for a hike and try and find a handful of lizards. Uh, we tried to include a lot of fun anecdotes and connections to literature, art, pop culture. Uh, if you've read some of Charles Other's books or been to his talks, you know that he's a wealth of information on these, um, you know, ancient art using rattlesnakes or, you know, uh, Shakespearean references to newts and things. So it's really fun to read and think about how for such a long time, these animals have really been influencing human cultures. Um, we tried to include something for everyone. So for families, people who are just getting into nature, people who are really experienced naturalists or students. Um, I'm a student of herpetology and I learned a lot of stuff writing this book. So we hope that you're able to learn something new as well. Um, and it was really motivated by our philosophy that the more we look, the more we see. So we hope that you uh, can agree and we'll get something out of it. So, oops. At this time, we're happy to take any questions that you might have. And cool. thanks again for watching. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, I kept switching teams throughout on, on which ones I found more, more interesting um, and learned a lot. So uh, for those of us joining, if you have questions, you can drop them in the chat now. We have one that's come in so far from Alessandra, and I think I know this Alessandra. Um, and she's curious if California newts are toxic to humans um, and not just other predators. Uh, Aaron, you um, want to answer this the way you, <laughs> you want to talk about the, the three hunters around the campfire? <laughs> sure, yeah. So they are toxic to humans. Um, there's, yeah, a folk tale that a lot of us know about three hunters that uh, were found dead at their campsite in the morning. And um, the sort of investigators found another body, which was a dead newt in the pot that was used to boil their coffee. Um, and so they are definitely, they can be lethal to humans. Um, I don't, I think uh, Jose had some um, nice stats on, you know, how lethal they are by injecting different animals. And I think, you know, just a couple milligrams can kill a mouse in a few seconds, things like that. So definitely a really potent toxin. Probably not too much to worry about um, if you're just handling it. I mean, I still wouldn't and definitely don't touch things like your eyes or your mouth. Um, but I think the real danger would be if you tried to eat one. Um, I think there was another story of someone messing around that swallowed a newt and then had yeah, a cardiovascular event and passed away. So not a good idea. Don't lick question. the newts. That's our bottom yeah. line. Don't lick newts. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of just handling, um, so like you had some great advice for going out and finding um, herps or for herping. Um, and do you have any advice about just like best practices for like, should you pick them up? When should you pick them up? What should you know if you do decide to pick them up? I think in general, if you are not sure, um, just don't touch. <laughs> But uh, like in our case, sometimes you find a new that is kind of like going to uh, across a bike trail or something, and when you see that there's a bike coming, you can you can pick them up and and put them on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, just make sure that you rinse your hands after. And it's um, it's really is like I think it's like one milligram to two milligrams enough to kill a person. But um, the thing is that the the deliver method is the most important. Like it, it really has to go like in contact with your uh, bloodstream or, or either by, by consuming it or, or making it or I don't know, a wound, but like really like rubbing it into the wound. So um, it's, it's really like not a threat uh, as long as you, you are you know, aware that what, what, what are you doing during that time? And you rinse your, rinse your hands and, and that should be yeah. 
uh, enough. Yeah. And and it did seem like one of the takeaways I had is that we really don't have to be nervous about basically any <laughs> of the reptiles or amphibians that we that we have around here. So there's like yeah the newt, um, and then rattlesnakes. But other than that, they you know some other best practices for herps, especially amphibians, is if you like have sunscreen on your hands or other things, um, those can transfer into their skin. And so we just generally try to not touch them. Um, if you do want to touch them or, you know, you're, you're moving one out of the road, like Jose said, maybe find a leaf in their environment and use that to pick them up, to protect them from whatever's on your hands. Um, instead of dumping water from your water bottle on them, if you see a, a frog that looks really thirsty, try and find a natural water source in its area and give it some water um, from that particular source. Um, for tortoises, we do often find them migrating across the road and that's a big threat to them. So we always say to just gently pick them up by the shell and move them in the same direction that they were going. So if they're, mm -hmm. you know, going east across the road, just put them on the other side in the same way. And then for snakes, we have, you know, a lot of herpetologists have either hooks or tongs. So you can um, gently pick them up and move them across the road. Um, without touching them, especially if you're not sure what it is, but you want to make sure it doesn't get hit by a car. Yeah. If you don't have a snake hook, you can always improvise with a big stick. Yeah, it's interesting. Let's talk about um, being run over by cars. I know around us in Santa Cruz, there's actually a, a pretty long standing community science project for some neighbors who live around a new crossing site that is just like every year they, they so they go and they count whenever they um, see a squashed newt and it's just in the thousands. And I, I think I read recently that um, uh, that population is at risk of being no more in the next um, like couple of decades at the rate that they're um, being squashed. So it sounds like you guys are recommending that if you see, if you see something in a road that maybe uh, helping it along is a good, is a good thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And we do have some other questions that have come in. So um, Suzanne is curious about skinks um, and where skinks fit in the classification of herps. Yeah, skinks are lizards. Um, they're lizards that look a little different because they have kind of like armored scales. They're really heavy and thick and kind of shiny to the, you know, how they look. Um, and they often have these really long bodies and really, really long tails. So you might actually kind of confuse it with a snake or I, I can totally understand why they're kind of like a weird uh, one to pin down in the herp space, but they're lizards. They're actually